These are all disorders based on scientific literature, evidence-based, that I have read that connect antibodies against wheat to all these immune and autoimmune disorders, including multiple sclerosis, to neuromyelitis optica, and arthritis and osteoarthritis, in particular thyroid autoimmunity. So please, if you go to your clinician, or if you are a clinician, and you have a patient with autoimmune disease, look at their diet, and if they react to certain food, remove that from their diet, and my recommendation will be forever, if they react strongly to that food. Because it is wrong to call this food allergy. This is not food allergy. When you measure IgG or IgA antibody, please do not say this is allergy to food. This is immune reactivity to food. That's why I try to call this food immune reaction and autoimmunity. I tried to change whatever happened in 1985-86, and, and so today now we are 2015. Okay, we have to move on. This is about food immune reactivity and autoimmunity, and not about food allergy. Food allergy, you eat something now, five seconds, 15 minutes later, you are going to have the symptoms and you have to go to hospital. That's food allergy. This is not food allergy. So I'm looking from the point of view of autoimmunity and reactivity against self, and not from the point of view of allergy. So therefore, that's in relation to wheat. What is the mechanism? This is one of the very recent mechanisms that you, this can apply to any food. Very similar to the peanuts, right? Here, food, Digestive enzymes usually will digest that, okay? But if the digestive enzymes do not work, these peptides <coughs> stay in the gut, and there are receptors on the epithelial cells of the gut for these peptides from different foods, in this case, gluten. Bind to that, by binding these undigested peptides to the receptor causes opening of the tight junctions, breakdown of the tight junctions, and now the, that peptide plus tight junctions presented to the immune system and then antibody and cytokines which destroys the epithelial cells. That's the mechanism how food can cause first destruction of the gut, epithelial cells, and then uh, may follow with other autoimmune disorders or reactions. So therefore, one more time, digestive enzymes playing a significant role in prevention of immune reaction or autoimmune. So this is another test that I came out with almost eight years ago. This is based on the fact that since you guys are from, you know, Santa Rosa, Northern California. We have lots of cases of Lyme, uh, Lyme disease. I have a pattern on why to test antibodies against various components of Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease. Everybody growing Borrelia in culture, all the labs that you know, I know, and measure only antibodies, IgG or IgM by ELISA or Western blood, against Borrelia grown in culture. Okay? Is that good enough? The answer is no. Why? Because as soon as Borrelia gets into the human body, changing its structure is so smart to hide from the immune system. And we call those stealth microorganisms. So by doing that, expressing new antigens. So therefore, we have to measure antibodies against those new antigens. Moreover, there are three subspecies. Everybody is growing one in our culture and measure antibody against that. There are two more subspecies. 
Garelia, Euxilia, and so forth, you have to measure antibody against that as well. And then co-infection, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and Bartonella. So that was the subject, subject of my patent almost 10 years ago. And that's how we do Lyme disease at the Dillon Sciences Lab. So exactly based on that, when I was reading so many articles in scientific journal about measuring antibody only against these components of wheat, which is called alpha gliding 33 amino acid, we can diagnose celiac disease. That was this transglutaminase, an enzyme in the gut. Based on these two, they say the patient is having celiac disease or no celiac disease. However, my argument with that is based on at least 20 different articles I read in scientific journals, and one of them also is written by myself about this, that if you don't measure antibodies against other components of it, gamma gliadin, omega gliadin, glutenin, luteomorphin, combination of gliadin to transglutamin, <coughs> you are going to miss 50% of the cases. That's based on scientific journal articles. Example, do you know what is wheat germ glutenin? It's 2%, this is not germination of wheat. It's about 2% of protein of wheat called wheat germ glutenin. We have receptors in all of our tissues for agglutinins and lectins. They are hard to digest. They mostly resist, resist the digestion. Therefore, even if we digest other proteins, we germ agglutinin will not be digested, we'll make antibody against that. So therefore, you have to do all of these in order to do diagnosis of celiac disease first. Secondly, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a scientific fact. Dr. Volta published an article last year, another one two weeks ago. He looked at population in Italy and found that they did not have celiac disease, but they had non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and therefore, by paying attention to those that remove gluten from their diet will improve significantly. To me, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, if it's not detected, is more dangerous than celiac disease. Why? Celiac disease, we can look at the gene, HLA-DQ2, DQ8. We can look at these two antibodies. We may miss 50%, but the other 50%, at least we can do correct diagnosis. Remove gluten from their diet. After six months, tissue will repair itself. But in the case of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, if you don't remove gluten from their, their diet, five, ten, 10 years later, this is my opinion, they may end with autoimmune disease. And so therefore, it's important to do all these tests. And this is uh, patent pending, that you know, most probably, hopefully in a few months, will be patented, you know, because we went back to the patent office many times. But this is what is done in other laboratories. This plus that. So there are other components. Ten additional tests, meaning determinations should be done for the correct diagnosis of celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. <coughs> How about cross-reactive foods? I published another article. Um, you'll see the reference up in the next slide. That you go to your clinician, and your clinician will tell you that you have celiac disease based on clinical observation, of course, plus laboratory testing. And then you remove gluten from your diet. And after a few months, based on the case scientific literature, a uh, certain percentage do not improve. You remove gluten. What's the reason? The cross-reactive foods, for example, Dairy cross-reacts with wheat. So you have to remove dairy in some of these cases. All of that. Uh, oats cross-react. Without its contamination, now we know it does cross-react. And you'll see the list of cross-reactivity in the next slide, but all of these should be done. Not, not all of these are cross-reacting, only Few of them are cross-reactive. 
The rest also, for example, if you have a patient with gluten sensitivity and say, okay, yes, you can have quinoa. And that patient will eat quinoa every day. How do you know quinoa is not, is not um, harmful to that patient? Have you tested that the patient doesn't make antibody against quinoa proteins before recommending that? And so therefore, it's important to look at this whole thing. And so here, the list of cross-reactivity. There is a test in the laboratory called dot blood. This is based on antigen-antibody reaction. Wherever you see color, for example, gliadin, we see a lot of color. That's antibody reacting with gliadin. But it reacts a little bit about the milk, with casein. Okay? And this is our negative here, for example, with tropomycin or sorghum, no reaction at all. But it reacts with alpha-beta casein. Not with casomorphine, but with milk group heterophony, with oats. Not with egg. Look at corn, yeast, <coughs> brewer's yeast, and baker's yeast. This is instant coffee contaminated with wheat during processing. So I proved that you can enjoy your pure coffee every day without <laughs> being worried about gluten. Because, because when I published this article, I think up to today I was looking, more than 3 million people looked at this article. There's so much discussion on the web about this whole thing. <laughs> but not every single item is cross-reactive. So that's, okay? So millet and rice, okay? Millet, rice, yeast, corn, and dairy. Those are the major ones. And then you'll see that when we acted that with human tissue, the tissue which the most reacted was hepatocytes, liver, cytochrome P450. What is cytochrome P450? These are liver enzymes responsible for detoxification of chemicals. Now you are, you know, you consume gluten, you make antibody against that, the antibody cross react with your cytochrome P450. And therefore you lose your liver function. GAD65, that's another you know, enzyme which is in the gut. It's involved in type 1 uh, diabetes, autoimmune diabetes. And uh, ganglioside in the brain, synapsin, myelinase protein, and cerebellar in particular. There are you know, several articles about cross reaction between gluten and brain tissue. So, therefore, this is scientific that gluten cross here with other foods as well as with human tissue. How about milk proteins and autoimmunities? This is again based on many, many articles, and all this is all of, all of this is possible in particular multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. There are several articles in a journal called Neuroimmunology were showed that milk cross react with myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein proteins in the neurons. So not every person will make antibodies against milk is going to have multiple sclerosis. Why? Because we have the perfect barriers, hopefully. The barriers, blood-brain barriers are okay. The antibodies can circulate in the blood, no harm is done. But as soon as your patient is stressed or exposed to toxic chemicals, lipopolysaccharides from the gut bacteria will open the blood-brain barrier. Now that antibody made against milk is going to attack your neurons. Then that's the mechanism of induction of neuroautoimmunity, such as multiple sclerosis. Antibody will attack the joints. That's the mechanism of rheumatoid arthritis. The antibody may attack the thyroid tissue, that will be the mechanism of thyroid autoimmunity. So, because of that, years ago, a few couple years ago, we, someone asked me, what do you think the percentage of healthy population reacting to milk and wheat? What do you think? It's not written here, right? 
What do you think will be the perceived outlet? One from all of you in here. How many of you will be highly reacting to wheat and milk? What percentage? How much? 70. No, that's exaggeration. This group, is, this group will be higher. Huh? This, this group will be higher. Okay, this group will be higher. I'm talking about, so yeah, healthy people. 20%. Percent. 20%. It's percent. right here. In this article published in the journal called Nutrient. Okay? Prevalence of antibodies against wheat and milk in blood. <coughs> And their contribution to neuroimmune reactivities. I'm calling it reactivities, not or immunities. Be careful. So, but the question I asked was, what percentage of those who make antibodies against milk and wheat, also they make antibodies against their own nervous system antigen? Half of those. So meaning 10% of the population right now are making antibodies against wheat and milk, which cross-react with their tissue, are in danger of developing autoimmune disease in the future. So therefore, when you go to your clinician and testing you, it's really that's early detection. You remember, detect, remove and repair? That's the detect. We'll detect at the early stage, you remove that from your diet, and you repair the barriers, and you prevent devastating disease such as multiple sclerosis or other neuroimmune disorder in the future. Sounds good, right? So I talked earlier about which are lectins. There are other lectins. Please pay attention to the lectins. There is one manuscript in here just about lectins. Lectins, we have receptor for, for them everywhere in our body. They are resistant to enzymes. And unfortunately, as we get older, the enzyme functionality goes down. And therefore, we need enzyme support to digest some of these lectins. Or we have to remove the lectins from our diet. Major beans, many beans contain kidney beans, white beans. They contain phytohemagglutinin and cannabalinin and other lectins, which is very difficult to digest. And that's why you have to cook them very well. If they're uncooked, that's the worst for your digestive tract. So that's also based on science. What do you see in here? What is that? <laughs> Ask yourself, what, happened? what kind of chemical reaction happened in here? I want that answer. What kind of chemical reaction happened in here? Food coloring binding to human tissue protein. We don't pay attention, right? Okay. Do me a favor whenever you have time, go online and ask whether or not food colorings are safe. <laughs> we'll find the answer. These food colorings were grandfathered because FDA was not in existence 60 or 70 years ago, and because they started using them many years ago, the companies continue using them, and therefore, uh, you know, they're in every single product. Look at this. So please remove, this is not just for ADD, ADHD. Remove food colorings from your own diet and from diet of your patients. And again, these are the associated disorders in relation to food coloring. From mechanism point of view, what happened? Food coloring binds, okay, first of all, to food proteins, right? So let's say if this is a protein and enzymes, the scissor is the enzyme, can cut, right? Peptide and then to amino acids, no problem. But when food coloring is bound to, 
the enzyme becomes dysfunctional. And there are many experiments in scientific journal. If you take a protein without food coloring and add enzyme to that, it will be digested in two hours. If you add food coloring to that protein, add digestive enzyme, it takes eight hours to digest them. And so if you eat something and you have bloating and all of these symptoms, pay attention to food coloring. So, it's part of the new test which I developed for Cyrex, which is part of the Array 10. 180 different foods, where a food testing panel that reflects the patient's actual diet. How many of you eat raw meat? Okay, one, two, three, okay, four. But the other 96% or 90%, we like to cook the meat. Is the antigen of raw meat versus cooked meat is the same? No. It's different. Raw peanuts versus cooked peanuts. Some people could be allergic to the raw, but not the, the but it roasted. But some people are allergic to roasted, but not to raw peanuts, that's possible. And the same thing for many other foods. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if we eat raw food, we have to measure antibodies against proteins of raw food. If we eat cooked food, for example, beans, we don't, we don't eat them raw. If we eat beans raw, we'll develop the area and probably we we'll lose a lot of uh, uh, water and all of that, and vitamins and so forth, we'll be really very sick. And so therefore we have to cook, therefore we have to measure antibodies against cooked beans and not raw beans. And so that's really the message, okay? So raw and cooked vegetables, raw and cooked fruits, raw and roasted nuts and seeds, cooked meat and what is meat glue? <laughs> yep. It's on the cover in here. We were in Las Vegas at A4M. One of my friends ordered breakfast in one of the cafes in Las Vegas. And this was the breakfast. Immediately I took a picture and then sent it to the journal to put it on the cover. So, does meat look really like this? Pay attention to the person. So the bottom line is if you look at a piece of meat, it doesn't look like natural cut, meaning they use meat glue. What is meat glue? It's transglutaminase. And so therefore now, don't be surprised that transglutaminase was part of the gluten testing. You may react to meat glue. It has nothing to do with gluten. That's a possibility. And so therefore, you have to test antibody against meat glue, which is transglutaminase. That's what we do. Raw and cooked fish and shellfish, gums. Show me a product that there is no gum in it. Almost every, you know, many products, you know, 50% of the products, okay? I'm exaggerating. But lots of products, you know, that you know, contain gums. Gums are large, large molecules that were introduced into the food because thought that the body cannot digest them and they act like a fiber. But then in reality, we can digest some of those. The size of the, for example, egg white protein is 48,000. Gum is 5 million. So that's why. We digest that with smaller peptides and proteins, like then can cause immune reactivity. Therefore, we have to measure and remove them from the diet. Food coloring already we talked. Oils. Let me put a question like this. If you have a child allergic to peanuts, can you give peanut 
oil to that child. And you cook in peanut oil. Why? There are very small amount of proteins called oleocytes. So that's why we measure antibodies against oleocytes. And then lectins and aglutins we talked about, and then there are other enzymes. So this is a panel of 180 foods that I developed, and I think you know everything is right here, explained here, the history is here. That um, I believe one of the best tests for detection of food immune reactivity or immune reaction with possible connection to autoimmunity. Forget about food allergy. Food allergy is about IgE testing. So, with that, let's continue. Uh, multiple sclerosis, I mentioned earlier, some food can contribute to that. Recently found that corn, tomato, spinach, and soybean contain a protein called aquaporin. Where do we have aquaporin? In blood-brain barriers. So if you make antibodies against these aquaporins, those antibodies against these aquaporins can turn against your own aquaporins and open the, the blood-brain barriers. So that's why uh, we added this to our testing of food immune reactivity and our immunity. Why I'm connecting this whole issue to all immunity? Because my mother suffered from osteoarthritis, okay? So here if we take blood from a patient with autoimmune disease, purify the antibodies to 100% pure. This is a method in the laboratory. We can isolate those antibodies. And this is based on, again, article published in Journal of Immunology. Then we take those antibodies made in the blood of patients with autoimmune disease. In this case, is scleroderma. That antibody reacts with which germ? With peas, corn, and spinach. This is the connection between food and autoimmune. So if you have a patient with scleroderma, definitely you have to remove these four from their diet. If I was the clinician, even without testing, I was going to remove these four from their diet based on this article published in Journal of Immunology. Another one, and I, again, I have another 20 slides like this. We take a patient with lupus which they make antibodies against ribonucleoproteins, the proteins inside the nucleus of the cell. Affinity purify them. React them with so many foods, you will see soy, carrot, corn, and spinach again. Corn and spinach. And by the way, in the earlier slide that I showed you about spinach aquaporin, and MS in Japan is made in neuromyelitis optica. Why? Because they consume more soy and spinach. They don't have MS like in the US. They call it neuromyelitis optica, which is a subclass of MS. So anyway, again, corn, spinach, soy. Corn, spinach, soy. Before that was corn, spinach, and tomato. So if you have a patient with lupus, you have to remove definitely these four items from your diet. And that's, I can go on and on and on. So this is the connection between food immune reactivity and all immunity. So this is the journal article, seven of them that you can read. So I finished with the chemicals. I discussed the role of diet in uh, all immunity. And now let's move to the infection. So here, dental infection with performance gingivalis, lots of articles in scientific journal. Here one. Periodontitis, performance 
intervalis, androgenous is aromatherapeutic. That's exactly what happened to my mother. When I was at graduate school about 40 years ago, I took blood from her and measured antibodies against hormonal changes. She had 10 times more antibodies against this bacteria versus you know, her friends who were healthy. And so therefore, then I connected this infection to rheumatoid arthritis. So now we have many articles in scientific journals. So therefore, please, it's not just the gut. Sometimes gut dysbiosis can start in the mouth. What is the mechanism? If you want to read about this, a journal called Autoimmune Disease. Autoimmune Disease. I wrote an article in that journal, under which data you can download because it's free, about probable role of environmental triggers in autoimmunity. And this is taken from one of that article which I wrote. So what happened that we have periodontal disease. Bacteria releases toxins, correct? That toxins can change the gut microbiota and release of all kinds of mediators can change. In this case, for example, we have tissue antigens called alpha enolase, an enzyme. That enzyme becomes citrullinated. One amino acid changes. So by alpha enolase becomes citrullinated, our own body is going to attack our own tissue due to infection in the mouth. Antibody are going to produce, and then the antibody is going to attack our tissue. But this reaction is not going to stop there. If we have other proteins who are citrullinated in our body, the body is going to attack all of those. That's why you are going to find, for example, in one patient, 10-20 um, reaction against when you measure antibody against their, their tissue. Sometimes this could, this could be a mechanism, but the root cause of that is in the mouth, but you find antibodies against various tissues. That's why we have to look at infections, in particular in the mouth and then in the gut. But it could be also Epstein-Barr or cytomegalovirus. That's why we test also for that. That's why this is a new panel, not available yet, just I'm doing research and development, 20 measuring antibodies against 20 different infectious agents. These are in the mouth, Helicobacter, Campylobacter, Yersinia, Clostridium, Candida, Rotavirus, all in the gut, and the toxins from these bacteria, parasites in the gut, Chlamydia, Streptococcus, and protein, Chlamydia, Acinobacter, Klebsiella, Mycobacteria, these are all bacteria involved in autoimmune diseases. Mold, Aspergillus, Penicillium, Staphylococcus, you know, I did publish a lot in the field, could be responsible if you have a, uh, uh, your patient is living in a house contaminated with mold, can activate some of the uh, immune components and act against the immune system and Citrinolated Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis, cytomegalovirus, herpes type 6, the agent of Lyme disease, but this year of lithium bacteria. So all of that will be in one panel, hopefully will be available in about six months. So now I discussed about the three major factors responsible for induction of autoimmune disease. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanism of autoimmune disease, additional mechanisms, and then we'll wrap up the video. So there are two major mechanisms protecting us against autoimmune disease. One of them is called oral tolerance. Remember that I brought the example of the baby is born. 
We build the immune system because they build their oral tolerance to tolerate many antigens, not to react against them, and therefore no harm is done. All of that is done by T-Rexa. The second mechanism happens in the thymus. Lymphocytes migrate from bone marrow to the thymus where there is a computer within. If, we have, if a lymphocyte migrates from bone marrow to the thymus as a receptor for self should be destroyed. If they have receptors for infectious agents should survive and then they go to the tissue and the circulation and protect us against our immunity in the future. But this is a perfect, you know, everything is perfect. But unfortunately, breakdown in oral tolerance, which I just gave you examples of infection, toxic chemicals, and dietary components, can result in breakdown of oral tolerance and our immunity. Regarding the thymus expression and mistake at the level of thymus, I don't know whether or not these environmental triggers can play a role. So these are some of the examples of all immune diseases. Some individuals will make antibodies against egg and sperm. That's why infertility. Many years of suffering and uh, many years of experience. And that's why we are measuring antibodies against 24 different antigens simultaneously, starting from the gut all the way to the brain. And, and therefore, we can detect, we can detect autoimmune reactivity. My, our goal is to detect autoimmune reactivity, not autoimmune disease. Because at the level of reactivity, you can, you can help your patients and reverse the course of autoimmune disease. Why? Because there are three stages in autoimmune disease. The first stage, we call that silent autoimmunity. You went to your doctor, did testing, found antibodies. Antibodies are not equal to a disease, but maybe 10 years later. Elevated antibodies with symptoms, symptoms and loss of function, but no severe destruction of the tissue found. So you can see that. But when this will continue, the patient will have significant elevated antibodies, significant symptom signs, and uh, many other uh, clinical findings, which is you know, maybe this is too late if you try to do something about it. That's why we have to detect it, hopefully, at this level or at least at stage one or stage two. So, I would like to, in closing, my message is environmental factors play a significant role in our immunity, including dietary component, infection, and toxic chemical. So first you have to do detect. Detect using different biomarkers, and these are some of them. The test I developed, I'm developing all the time for Cyrex laboratories. So you have to use the right methodology to detect abnormalities. So we are going back to those three items, detect, right? Then comes what? Remove the triggers. How? By detoxifying of the body, treat the infection, exercise, minimize medication, drink pure water, remove offending foods from your diet, eat pure foods, minimize lectins and agglutinins. All of that is part of the removing the triggers. And then, repair the barriers. Okay, how we do that? We want functional T-Rex cells, activated T-Rex cells, but we don't want pathogenic T helper cells to become activated. Down regulation of TH17, up regulation of T-Rex cells. And these are some of the items, including green tea, which by the way recently showed that also works against cancer cells. 
and so all of that. Peritomy, lipoic acid, and many, many, many others. And unfortunately, from time to time also, you read in the Scientific American or other journals articles like this that telling the public when vitamins kill, <laughs> kill the myth of antioxidants, and then the next page is when vitamins kill. It's about that experiment they did in smokers who gave them some vitamin A and others, and then they found you know, more cancer in them. But this is only one study out of 50,000 that I know that vitamins can help in situations like this. And finally, the last slide, the uh, last couple of slides. Please pay attention to your gut. Gut bacteria, if you give them probiotics, what they do, they produce acetate, butyrate, and propionate. That is going to do what? To activate the T-Rex cells. Remember the T-Rex cells? And so therefore, probiotics. Another article from Journal of uh, Trends in the Immunology, January 2015. This is a fascinating article that vitamin A, vitamin B3, vitamin D3, all of that activate receptors on T-Rex cells and prevent autoimmunity. I can go on and on and on until tomorrow morning and give you evidence-based articles. So vitamins, in this particular case, can activate your T-Rex cells and prevent autoimmunity. And therefore, please pay attention to this like this, that cocoa powder, vitamin D, vitamin A, N-acetylcysteine, glutamine, L-glutamine, and rice bran, vitamin C, vitamin E, and many others, probiotics, all of that, I do not even, I have anything against IVIG sometimes. Your patient may not improve with all of that. You need to give them intravenous immunoglobulins, or you have to give them even doxycycline or minocycline, which are anti-inflammatory. So with that, I'm ready for question and answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, after you've done an array, you've discovered the sensitivities, and you've removed those things for a period of time, is it reasonable that you strengthen the gut that if you retest them, that their uh, autoimmunity sensitivity reactivity will be reduced significantly, or does it be? My answer, thank you for asking that question. Uh, my answer will be based on my personal bias, because I have genetic makeup for osteoarthritis. If I react to certain food, I'll remove it from my diet and I will never go back. But maybe another individual who do not have genetic makeup for autoimmunity, therefore your clinical judgment is going to play a role in that case. Cooperation of your patients with you is going to play a significant role. You know, so I know it's difficult to remove sometimes 30% of the fluid out of 180 that patient is reacting to, to remove that all of that from their diet. But in my case, my recommendation will be, if they react strongly to certain foods, even if you repair their gut, do not reintroduce them. But the final judgment is your clinical judgment. And actually, a follow-up on that. Are you actually seeing changes in IgG levels, e even though clinically we might not want to reintroduce the food, 
but if you have positive IgG, can you ever see that revert back to negative IgG? Uh, my I'm answer is yeah, yeah, very good. I, I think first of all, it takes very long time to reduce levels of IgG antibodies. That time, at least, is six months. So if you repeat the test, uh, like uh, a month later, we had a case with Sergio Azolino. You know him? Okay. A child with certain disorder, we found 90% of 180 foods were completely positive. So what do you do in this case? We move all of them. What we found out, actually, this child is making something I'm writing an article because of, because of that right now about polyreactive antibodies. What are polyreactive antibodies? Antibodies in our body made against one antigen, but they can change their structure and, and bind to many other food antigens simultaneously. We repeated that after one month, we had only 20% change. Still 70% of the you know, foods were positive in that case. So maybe in this case, child is under certain oxidative stress, maybe the child is having some kind of infection. So we have to find the root cause of that. And now we are learning. I really do not have an answer right now for that, for that kind of example I gave you. But in the future, hopefully, we'll have an answer. For example, if you give, give them five grams of vitamin C, which is antioxidants for a certain period of time, and you do retest, some of those polyreactive antibodies are going to disappear. Or let me give you another example that this may open the horizon about some of the laboratory testing. That uh, if you have a patient with Epstein-Barr virus, highly positive, and you test that patient for Lyme disease, you get false positive for Lyme disease. If you have a patient with Yersinia enterocolitica in the gut, the antibody reacts with Lyme, and you get false positive for Lyme. If you have a patient with Lyme disease, with Epstein-Barr virus, you get 40 different foods positive on the food testing. It's due to cross-reactivity, but not due to <laughs> food sensitivity, if we call it. So this is very complicated. We don't have an answer for everything. We are learning every day. Two questions. One, if you've taken an array and you have, what does equivocal mean? Because you'll have like clearly you're allergic to it, you're off the charts, and then you have you're not allergic at all, and then there's that section of equivocal. And the other is if you're allergic to dairy, is butter in a different category? Thank you. Very good question. Okay. Equivocal meaning weakly positive, weak positive. Still is positive. 
I rather be completely at the negative column of the testing. When we do research and we do validation, that's why it takes us a year to introduce a new test. Like the one about the infection, I started nine months ago. Still is not ready. Why? We have to look at like two, three hundred samples from healthy subjects 